Um, let me, there we go. All right, so what I'm doing is I've got Microsoft Teams up. I am doing a live recording um, with FreeCam 8. It's a free software online. And then I have my phone up going, doing a live broadcast to TikTok. So if anybody has any questions they want to ask while they're viewing, they can go ahead and do that. Um, I have my notes here, everything that I have to ask you. I do, okay. again, I want, to appreci I want to say I appreciate you doing this for me. This is wonderful. Um, it's my first <laughs> interview, actually, so um, I do right. have some nervousness, but I am going to keep my composure. I, it's not my first one, so just chill out. It's always just a conversation, and you're going to have oh. great shit. No reason to be worried about it. Just bring your awesome, and, you know, I'm real easy to talk to and happy to be here, and uh, good job. Let's do it. All right. Act like you've done it before, right? You know what I mean? It's just like have that attitude that it's just talking to somebody. Always treat the person when you're interviewing other people like they're just people. Yeah. Exactly. Your Iowa. Bring your hardcore Iowa. It'll be fucking good. <laughs> I'll, I'll bring the cow pies, right? <laughs> there you go. Fine. That'd be great. All right. Um, all right. So everybody on TikTok, uh, we've got a guest appearance here today. It's Lee Ehrenberg, star of Once Upon a Time and also Pirates of the Caribbean. Those are the two most notable, but it's not the only ones that he's done. Um, sure. What we're going to cover today, first off, obviously you are an actor, writer, and director. I mean, I'm, I have I, I multi-hyphenate. I think you have to have, uh, nowadays, you can't just do one thing. I think creator would be a better word, perhaps mm -hmm. even. I like that word, creation. Uh, in terms of art and in terms of just everyone has side hustles now, right? Oh, yeah. So I could put construction guy on there. I could put, you know, whatever, cameo dude. I'm like, <laughs> whatever, a convention <laughs> dog. Because you got to do whatever, it's tough times. you got to do whatever you can do these days. So I, I fully agree. Um, and I see that you were born in Palo Alto, California. Palo Alto, yeah, next to Stanford University. Awesome. Yeah, but I was I was very young when I moved away from there, so I don't really have any memories. I grew up in Santa Monica, okay. and I think it was two or three months when I moved there, maybe. Wow. I, I I spoke to my birth mother, and she told me that we had lived in California. She originally was from California and then moved to Clinton, Iowa with her mother and father and then grew up there, had a family there. Um so we went back to California for a brief, just a visit, and then cool. went to Florida, Nebraska, and then just settled in Iowa again. I was uh, one of four children. Never been, never been to Iowa. I'd like to go. I'd like to come to a convention there just to see it. Uh, it's got a great people, salt of the earth, Midwest of our country, legendary, fed the, fed the world, man, Iowa. <laughs> well, and I'm actually, there's a TikToker on um, line that I'm friends with as well. He uh, is mainly famous for the Bill Cosby impersonations he does. Oh, really? Yeah. Cool. His name is Marvin Howard. And What's up, Marvin? I'm working with him that sometime next year around, yeah. like right before school starts, um, we're going to try to get a live show going to where he can come in and, you know, do his comedy, answer questions, you know, fun just have that. fun. Good. Yeah. Yeah, there's always, like, I like that idea. I like that idea of a variety show and, you know, where you, when you uh, support your other, the other artists trying to get a break and be noticed and stuff like that's really clever, actually. Oh, yeah. Because and, really you know, it's not so much about the money, but more about the promotion of the person and having a good time, like I'd stated. Um he lives down in Texas, actually, and is uh, just moved into a new place. So, getting him some more notoriety out there and just having a fun time. Right. We're, you know, not even really talking about the profits about it, but yeah, we're splitting the profits of the show. So it'll help me all out right. as much as it'll help him, and we're just gonna well, have fun. Well, I wish you all the best with all that. Yeah, that's cool. Um, yeah, just do your best and uh, go for it. And don't worry about the results at the end, you know. Oh, yeah. Just get after it. So I want to touch base on a couple of things here. Um, I've got right. down here younger years at about eight years of age. Uh -huh. You started in your acting career 
um, playing well, well, in mean, David versus Goliath called Killing Goliath? No. <laughs> I mean, it's funny. That's an old bio, right? So, I mean, I don't even know. It's like a 20-something-year-old bio. That story was like, no, I acted in the Hebrew school play at my at like my synagogue, and I played David, right? And uh, mm-hmm. killed Goliath, David versus Goliath. You know, this is the legendary Bible story. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, yeah, it was amateur stuff, though. I wasn't a pro till I was after college. Okay. So all the stuff I did, uh, a lot of it in school. I had a lot of great teachers. But, yeah, I got the first taste of the bug when I was eight in uh, basically, like, I mean, the synagogue, the church play, if you will, you know? Okay. Mm-hmm. So um, did that... I would say that actually is what kind of sparked your interest in the acting and uh, arts field, or was it later yeah, on? Yeah, I mean, it opened my eyes to it. I mean, uh, later on when I was like about 11, I, I went for my next play, like a real play, and uh, I got cast in it. And there was something about when you're auditioning for plays, they post like lists, like they do it at schools too, like who makes the callbacks, and, you, and, and it was just, there was something about keep making it and seeing your name on the list. I was like, wow, I guess I'm good at that. You know, sometimes you just, well, you don't know, right? Oh, yeah. And uh, and so that was probably where I got more of the bug when I was 11. But I sort of like at eight, I was always like a funny kid and loud mouth. Right? <laughs> so, like, Were you a class clown in school? I was real, I mean, I, I, I don't know if I was the class clown. But I was like the actor in class by the time I got to high school and stuff. And I went to like a, a school where there were like movie star kids and people that became Sean Penn and Emilio. And I'm sure it's on your list to talk about my brat pack yep, buddies. Robert but. Downey Jr. went to school at yeah. Santa Monica High. Yeah. Yep. Great times. I mean, Robert was a couple years younger. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, that's where we all sort of, I mean, Emilio was a good, real good friend of mine. Sean actually directed a play. Oh, sorry. This is my light went out. Um, let me just plug in real quick in two seconds. Sure. That was a rookie mistake. Um, I, I like good lighting. Oh, yeah. So I, I have a light bar. I have a one of those ring lights, too, but I I, didn't, I don't have it set up. So anyway, apologies for the tech. I've got Problem. the same thing here. I went to a store called, if you come to Iowa, there's a store called Five Below. Ooh, rap. Uh, I think we might even, what is it? Like a general store? It's a, I um, think kind of Dollar Tree meets um, Walmart. Okay. You got, you know, Dollar Tree meets Walmart meets Sephora and Ulta Beauty. I mean, you've got all this stuff for youngsters, but you've it's got all this practical stuff for adults, too. Yeah, so, I love Walmart. It's the, um, I mean, there's something about it. I, I miss that. I miss those stores, like, in my youth where you go and they have a little bit of everything. Oh, yeah. And this one is five below. But they also have, you know, the other prices. They have things that are $10, $20. But that's when you get into your high-end electronics devices, et cetera. Still at a good price. Oh, yeah. Wonderful. And actually, yeah. this, um, I don't know if you can see it here. I'm going to pan over. That ring light right there. Oh, yeah. I got that for five bucks from five below. That's a good one. It's good lighting. It looks good. And I paid probably, well, mine, mine has all these effects on it and it's big. So like I can do, I can make it look like it's a siren. I mean, like a police car or a fire truck or strobe, different things. So I don't know. I'm, I'm not that I'm a big tech guy, but, uh, I like gadgets, but it's a bigger, it's like an 18 incher. Cause sometimes I'll do the, the, uh, Zoom theater stuff and, uh, or acting class and I want good lighting for that or auditions. Oh, and you have to have good lighting. I found out recently doing a TikTok video, somebody, um, kind of went all race, um, attack on me because I had done the Wicked Witch from Once Upon a Time, Zelina. <laughs> and, um, uh, the green Did you get all green? The green Did you go- that I used when I didn't have the right lighting, it made my skin look African-American brown. Uh, okay. And they thought that I was 
being kind of racist about it. And I said, no, I'm not. It's just my lighting wasn't that great, so I'm sorry. Yeah, you don't want that. Yeah, that's not a good one. No. Right, so, and that character, I mean, for anybody, but, like, that's just, like, a bad mistake that you don't want to have to be explaining away anyway. So, very good reason for good lighting. I, I, paid, I, I was green in the high school play, speaking of where we were with, like, talking about, like, my growing up stuff. And uh, by the time I got to high school, for sure, I wanted to be an actor, for sure, 100%. I wanted to go to theater school and all stuff. So, But I did a play my junior, I think it was my junior year of high school, uh, where I turned into a rhinoceros. Mm. And it, the, this character, it's a, about the rise of fascism, Ian Esco's play called Rhinoceros. But basically, the... This guy, the lead guy is the one guy who doesn't turn, everyone else turns into rhinos. And this character I play is like loudmouth friend actually turns into one on stage. So go, and so I had to be painted green and then I had a horn. And you go, the character goes into the bathroom and progressively comes out more and more in makeup. Mm-hmm. So, but what I'm saying is that green makeup sucks because it doesn't come off for a long time. I was always amazed at how when they could do it on once, you know, that it just didn't get. The old days, that makeup's got on your sheets, it got in, you know, your clothes. Yeah, I, I definitely, after getting that experience on TikTok, I wanted to make sure I didn't have that problem ever again. Cool, yeah. yeah. All right, so besides the um, David and Goliath um, skit for your Hebrew well, school, what yeah. really sparked your interest in the arts and entertainment industry at such a young age? I mean, watching movies, just watching watching TV, like, just, I don't know, there was something about being a storyteller. I was just a natural at, like, getting response out of people, right? Yeah. That's what it really was about, you know? I loved, I liked that I was good at it and I could connect with people. And I think that was it for me, too, because I... As you'd asked me earlier in the year, you asked me, is this something that you're interested in getting into? Are you really wanting to get into the acting thing? I said, yeah. "Yeah." Because when I was in high school, I was a part of a group called Drama Troop. Right. And we, you know, did our practice and everything out at Starlighter's Theater in Anamosa. And so for me, um, watching the movies growing up and, you know, having my inspirational actors like Robin Williams and... um, there was okay. a couple of others, Eddie Murphy. Well, uh, Eddie, yeah. Mark Hamill was a big inspiration for me because I saw him do not only Luke Skywalker in Star Wars, but I saw him do the um, Joker in Batman, the original cartoon. Oh, wow. Well, yeah, he's great on that, right? And so, and I mean, he had a real resurgence because he had that bar- bad car crash, cut his face. Yeah. I mean, I'm not sure the whole story of that, but I, I just look up to that guy's perseverance and obviously his talent. Oh, yeah. That was an interesting. Yeah, he's a badass, right? And that now, I think he's achieved that in our society that we all recognize Mark Hamill as like a legendary dude. Yeah. But it was it was definitely in doubt in the seventies when he got hurt, and then into the eighties when he probably didn't work as much as he should have worked. You know. Well, and with what they had to work with back then too. I mean, you were born in the sixties. You were born in nineteen sixty-two. So yeah. I mean, that was before the. Star Wars hit and everything. Um, it was before Star Trek when I was born, yeah. dude. Yeah. And so what they had to work with then made them even more infamous because um, they didn't have the technology we have today. Oh, for filmmaking? Or they, I mean, they didn't have any technology. Everything they had to work with, clothing, their... Uh, um, yeah, there's so much. I mean, the shot. society has advanced in a lot of ways, you know. The movie making business, everything. The computer wasn't around, you know. When I was a kid, when I was born, computers was the army had the only computers, mm-hmm. or they were giant like IBM things with punch cards. Yeah. Right. Oh yeah. A computer would be a five story building, one computer. Oh yeah, ENIAC. Mm-hmm. So anyway, I go back to all that in the six and technology and just your whole life. Right? It's just being alive for a, you know, like, what year were you born? I was born in 1986. Okay. So, still, you've been on the planet for a while. So, things that you remember from 
even the, the turn of the millennium, like 2000, 2001. There's not, you didn't have, not everyone had laptops and computers at home. Oh, no, we didn't we have, have laptops for students in school. We had to use the oh. school computers or have one at home. I, we didn't even have computers in school. We had typewriters and people would have typewriters, yeah. you know. Yeah. I remember when I was in, this would have been fifth grade. Right. was the first time I ever actually typed on a computer, and it was an old Apple, um, oh gosh, it was one of those with the three and a quarter floppy disks. Oh, yeah. I sold training. I mean, before I was an actor, like after college, I, I just had a few jobs, and uh, one of them was selling computer training on floppy disks. <laughs> like, so it goes way back, you know. I didn't even think I had a computer. I was just fully bullshitting. Well, I'm not sure if you remember um, this computer. is a Commodore SX64. I don't remember the model, but I remember Commodores. I sold hardware after the software job, mm -hmm. um, and my buddy built his own laptops. And, but I used, to, I used to sell a lot of gear to these businesses, setting up businesses with computers. Because computers were not at home. Like at, so we're talking nineteen mid nineteen eighties. Mm -hmm. The the homes people didn't have the home stuff. I remember I remember the first apples, you know, and uh I'm not sure I had my first computer till the late nineties even, my first laptop. Oh wow. Yeah, I had my first my first laptop was actually when I was in high school and it was a portable computer. It was a Commodore SX sixty four. A person, a part of the ham club for amateur radio yeah. in Jones County, gave it yeah. to me as just a yeah. gift. And it was the first color and monochrome uh, display computer that was ever released. It was like a thousand dollars sold in nineteen ni or nineteen eighty three. Yeah. So it was old, but a giddy. Yeah, and it was super expensive, super heavy, no power. You know, low resolution and, and, uh, I think yeah, I can remember, you know, you'd have to like to upgrade graphic cards, open it up, put it inside, you know, it's like you're, a lot of hands on stuff, uh, which is still the same today. They're just all microchips and, you know, uh, but the advance of all of it, right? So I don't think you can fight that. I think you have to celebrate that, um, and just be happy. Like, like I think as you get older, like, Stay current, stay young at heart, never age. You can age physically, but you don't have to age mentally. Right. Still be right. serious, right? I mean, because technology is going to jump in your lifetime. Well, I would say you're never too old to learn new things. Ooh. No. I like that one. Yeah. All right. So let's get into your acting career here. Um, yeah, Some sure. notable roles I brought up. Right. Looking online, found that you were in Tales from the Crypt. Yep. Seinfeld, yep. Star Trek, which you were right. in actually four of those. You were in Deep Space Nine, Next Generation, Voyager, and Enterprise. Yeah, I did all this, all of them, and I had. Uh, yeah, that was a good show. That was fun. I like my, I like being part of the Star Trek uh, world. Now the Enterprise that was uh, the star of that show was Scott Bakula. Yeah, Scott Bakula. Yep. He's, he's uh, yeah, he's a very cool dude, and uh, I did two episodes of that one. Where my guy at Tellerite makes peace with uh, the Andorian, another Rick. Uh, so it's a whole thing where I'm like the snarky, and it's really a big heavy mask, a lot of prosthetics on that show. Okay. And then also noted you were in Friends, Robocop 3. Right. Um, for the older generations, Project Alf as the gate guard. Oh, God. See, I just forgot about Alf. That was a gate guard. But my personal favorites, you were in, of course, besides Once Upon a Time in Pirates of the Caribbean, um, yeah. you were in Mickey Matson and the Copperhead Treasure. Yeah, did you see that? I own it. What? <laughs> yes. Jeff, no one's ever asked me about Mickey Matson. So fun, that it movie. It's one of my favorites, and you're one of my favorite characters in there. Is what's in the, what's have... that guy's name again? What's my character um, in that one? I can't remember. Uh, oh, I forget the name. It was like Bobby Lee or something like that. You you had um, long hair. <laughs> well, he wore a wig. Remember, he had that fake wig that he wore around, thinking yep. people believed it. I was so fun. That guy was working with my buddy Frank Drank, Ernie Hudson. 
that was a lot of fun. I, no one's ever asked me about Mickey Madsen, so seriously. Like I said, that is one of my favorite movies is Mickey Madsen and the Copperhead Treasure. Oh, Especially man. when the kid gets the Petoskey Stone from his grandfather. <laughs> So, um, oh, good one. Wow, that's, you just scored some points. <laughs> so, in all those, um, which there are many more, you had a total of, um, no all together, there were, yeah. I found, 115 acting movie roles wow. since 1987. Right, and that's not, like, the thing is, I did 60 or whatever once upon a time, mm-hmm. like in five. You see what I mean? So, it's like, it's interesting, like, that's a good number, I think. 115. Oh, yeah. So, as an actor, um, I guess my first question, um, you make friends with the others on the set. And with as many as you've done over the years, um, I mean, I guess I'll say this is kind of a... You were on Pirates of the Caribbean for three of the... Um, First three. The first three yeah. movies. Right. Um, Johnny Depp, now this is something that's popular in the news right now. Um, it states that he won't be in the POTC films any longer. Oh, yeah. Um, they are going to do archived footage of him in Pirates of the Caribbean 6, but what are your sure. personal feelings towards this action against Depp? And um, I'm just what curious. Action? What do you feel about how they're removing him? What's your personal feeling? Oh, I don't. I mean, I don't know that they. I don't know that any of that's true. And I love Johnny like like more than anything. He's an amazing, amazing dude. I'm a thousand percent on his team always. Um, but I think those are not. I don't think any of that's true. Mm-hmm. I don't believe like there's a big rumor mill about the sixth movie, mm-hmm. uh, and I so I can't verify any of it. And people always think I'm verifying this or verifying that. I, no, I don't know anything other than rumors. And it's always pops up on my stuff because I have, like, Google Alerts for, like, pirate stuff. Because I, I love being a pirate. Oh, yeah. I loved it. That was my childhood dream role, you know? I kind of done it. I got to be a pirate with Johnny Depp and Jeffrey Rush and Kieran Knightley. And, and then I got to be grumpy. But, I mean, when I got the pirate thing... And that is, I was down in the dump, you know, whatever. It came at the right time. Everything comes at the right time, uh, you know. And uh, I've never stopped enjoying it, put it that way. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm very grateful to that one. Okay. And very grateful. Now, <laughs> as, a, as a spoiler, if possible, are you going to be in the next POTC? I just said I don't even know if there is one, dude. You don't know if there is one? That's my whole point. Like, uh, like. Gotcha. I don't, the rumor thing, it's like, there's so many rumors, it's never real until they send you the script or call you up to come read for it, um, because I would think, uh, you know, I've never seen, they haven't done any announcements or anything, there's maybe, there's a, just a rumor mill. Yeah, if I was out to be in it, I would to be in it. Yeah. I mean, it's so much fun to be a pirate. There's some stuff on, the reason why I was asking is there's some stuff on IMDB about oh, really? the POTC uh, 6. So. But is it like, is it like actually up on Jerry Bruckheimer's page? That, that I haven't checked. This is just that's what I'm IMDb. saying. Like, that, that's my point. It's like, it's like, if it's up on the official stuff and they do a poster of it or then you know it's coming, whether I've heard Margot Robbie, I've heard a lot of great things. There's so many pirate stories to tell. Uh, the, the, the women pirates, obviously, I loved, I mean, Kira was amazing, mm-hmm. but the lesson of like Mary Bonnie and Anne Reed and the real history of the pirates, it's just, there's a lot of stories you could tell. I would think it's hard without Johnny, but, cause Johnny to me is what the pirates was, was about. His brilliance and, you know, the, the Jack Sparrow is, that's all you, I mean, you can't, it's like, it's, it's not a Jack Sparrow movie. Then, I, then I'd have to see and hope it was great. Yeah. You know? But Jack Sparrow is the shit. He's so badass. Just a brilliant, one of the greatest characters ever created. I agree. I am 100% on Team Johnny Depp. 
Yeah. I mean, listen, I think that uh, his artistry is just without question. Agreed. All right. So, um, also, uh, touching base, just wanted to ask some personal questions here, if that's all right with you. <laughs> all right. So, um, just for the fans here, uh, just some favorite food items. What would be your favorite breakfast item? Ooh. I like a good plate of, like, bacon and eggs or whatever. I mean, I'm kind of like a – I'd be a truck driver. I'm a truck driver. I think I eat some stuff. So, yeah, I like I like that. I also like, uh, uh, yeah, bacon and eggs. Okay. And then lunch? Ooh, lunch. I mean, if I have bacon and eggs for breakfast, I probably don't have lunch. But if I just have lunch, a sandwich, maybe some ramen with a bunch of stuff added into it, uh, I like – I like that. I like Asian food. I like Indian food. So maybe just something a little spicy, a salad. That'll be my lunch. Right. And then last food of the day, dinner. Dinner. Well, I'm a good. I'm a pretty good cook. Um, you, Iowa. I like to do like I'm sort of. My wife always says I'm famous for Lee's meats. But she wants me to have a YouTube channel where I just like cook tri tips and uh, you know roast chickens. So. I don't know. I think I'm like part Dungeons and Dragons dwarf, you know. I got a, I can I got a uh, recipe you can try then, whether it's called um, Maple Burgers. Ooh, all right. Tell me about it. Go ahead and take just a pound of hamburger. I mean, uh -huh. take a half pound if you're only doing a couple of people. Um, right, right, right. Mix that in with some oatmeal, some egg. So throw in one egg, about a cup of oatmeal. Okay. And then add in one tablespoon of maple extract. Or one teaspoon of maple extract. Okay. Um, sorry, I'm not doing it. Right. There we go. Um, and then add in a quarter, like one um, line of a stick of butter into it. Okay. And about maybe two tablespoons of sugar. Mix that all together, form uh -huh. it into a patty, and throw it into the skillet with some nonstick spray. Yeah. And let that fry up, y'all, the maple burger. Yeah, it sounds pretty good. It, the sugar will burn, though, won't it? Get a little caramelization not going. You, not if you do it over a low heat. Low heat, yeah. 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 So. Yum. Yeah. That sounds good. I like that. I mean, that's a, that's a, what other, you got any other good ones? Like the maple burger. <laughs> um, I got some recipes. I'll send them your way over on Instagram. Far up. All right. <laughs> All right. So now, with any, uh, appetite everybody has an appetite for sports now you oh, yeah. mentioned on your twitter and instagram that you're a big raiders fan i'm a big like sports guy for sure i like my manchester united that's my football team i pretty much like every sport like if i wasn't an actor i'd love to be a sportscaster okay right so what would be your of the four major sports um industries what would be your favorites for football basketball baseball and hockey I mean, I like them all, but, uh, I mean, the NFL is my probably number one at this age. I love, I love the football. Cause I do the fantasy football. I love the NFL, but I like all those. I mean, I watched hockey. I watch it. I watch it all. You know, I really do. So, like I said, I could do the ESPN. Do you follow? Um, there's one team I've been trying to follow. Um, Michael Coleman, your, uh, co-actor in Once Upon a Time. He's the Vancouver uh, Canucks guy. Yeah. yeah. He uh, loves the Vancouver Canucks. Right. So I always kind of try to follow up on them. I'm an L.A. Kings guy. That's my hockey team. Okay. Uh, and uh, so we are we play in the same division as those guys. But, yeah, there's a natural rivalry between his Vancouver team and my L.A. team. All right. Um, besides sports, food, and acting, what would you say would be your favorite pastime? I like to travel. Yeah, I'd say travel is probably the best. And I like, I mean, I like to ride my bike. I like to play golf. I like to hang with my dog. I like to, uh, yeah. But travel, travel with my family is really fun. And uh, that would probably be my number one. Just go see the world with my wife and my son before he leaves the nest. <laughs> what, <laughs> totally. place, what places have you been in your travels? I have been to Asia. I've been almost, like, a lot of places, but I've been to, Most for example, 
Uh, some of my favorites would be I love Morocco. I love Mexico. I like going to Europe. So I'd, Paris, Madrid, London, Amsterdam, any of that. I, Germany, I love. Italy is my favorite. Rome is incredible. Uh, Thailand. I worked in China. I'd like to go to Japan. But I think I gotta pretty much, I gotta get to Australia. Um, but the conventions, you know, I gotta get, I gotta, I need to land another part that gets me some more conventions. <laughs> like, you know, well, I've Iowa, never been. Iowa's got Des Moines. We've got this, um, love it. Seven Flags yeah. Center, as well as, um, I think Cedar Rapids has the U.S. Cellular Center. Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, listen, Iowa is about, I mean, for me, when I think of Iowa, I think of wrestling, mm-hmm. college yeah. wrestling. Oh, Some yeah. of the great, I mean, incredible. Like I'm saying, I, I, I like the all the Olympic sports. I'm really knowledgeable about all these sports. So when I think Iowa, I think of, this is what I think of right now. I think of Jayhawks losing to Purdue at home this season. And I watched that. Uh, I was like, unbelievable. And then Purdue went on to beat somebody at Michigan State or something just the other day. So Big Ten, I think Big Ten. Um, but I think of how great the wrestling teams in Iowa were when I was a kid, Gable, Van Gable, and all these legends from Iowa, right? So there you go. All right. So, let me see here. Now, you mentioned that you did um, an alien character in Star Trek, but you've also done Grumpy slash Dreamy Dwarf in Once Upon a Time. Right. So that brings me to my question of makeup studio. Now, okay. when you do those roles, you've uh, there's a lot to deal with when you have to dress up for a character. Um, uh, yeah. The main point is uh, time consumption. How long? What's the longest, or is it really long to go in and get ready for those roles? Oh yeah, it's hours. Depending on it, Star Trek, I think it's three four hours of sitting in the chair. But you understand then you. Once you get in the makeup, you're kind of, you're never not being touched up and made to look camera ready, mm-hmm. right? So you're going to have to have some, you have to have some responsibility when you wear a makeup about what you eat or if you eat at all or uh, maybe like with pirates, the mustache and beard to try and get them off and reapplied because maybe they'll, if they were lace. So stuff like that. It can be, it's time consuming, uh, but it goes you, you should take pride in it and ownership to make the makeup job easier because like that acting is a team sport, especially like movies and TV. Uh, so, you know, if hopefully you have a good relationship with your makeup artist and then you, then you look out for each other because they definitely look out for the actor. That's how they get in trouble. If your makeups, if their you know, makeup's bad or it starts running or sweaty. Oh, yeah. Right. Which yeah. brings me to my next question. Bloopers. Okay. Any makeup mess ups? Um, have you had that where all of a sudden something goes wrong with it, but yet it turns into a kind of a funny, even though you had to redo it? Uh, I mean, in, in the theater, we used to get busted a lot if, like, your wig came off or any of that would be a big no no. So maybe, like, in Pirates, the beard popped off a few times in a shot. But not too many. I mean, the guy that did my makeup on Pirates, Joel Harlow, has gone on to win a bunch of, like, at least two Oscars. So you're talking a lot of money if the makeup, if, you know what I mean, if the makeup messes up. So I can't remember if that, any major blooper makeup ones, right? I am sure on teeth popped out a couple times, the beard popped, but it was never when it mattered. If it was in a big shot where things were blowing up or whatever, I'm, I would have probably tried to hide it from the lens and not ruin the take. Gotcha. Right? With my close-up, yeah, I'm going to stop right away and make a joke out of it. But if the, if the camera's on something big where they can probably cut me out if there's a problem, I'm probably going to try and cover it and not let the camera see. Yeah. It might not use that take, right? You know, Especially like a big movie or a big show where there's a lot going on. If you're not the, if you're the primary focus of the camera and your makeup messes up, they'll stop right away. Cut. You don't have to worry about it. It's not a biggie. 
But let's say they're going to blow up the Black Pearl or these pirate ships, and you go, I saw an actor do this one time, to be honest with you. Um, in China, I was on this movie, I don't know if it's on your list, called Warriors of Virtue. And we were in this giant arena doing this big scene with cranes and all this stuff. And this one guy goes out of the blue, hey, I'm, I, I, I'm sweating. Come get my... And the makeup artist just comes over and goes, you know you're an ant in the frame, right? That's when he said, and I'll never forget that. I was like, oh, that's a good note. Yeah, you, you got to think about the size of the camera. I don't know what his issue was. And I think he you know, might have been in the shot. But for me, I was like, yeah, I'm an ant in the frame. So just get my position, figure my location. Got always, you can see the camera, it sees you, all that stuff. Cool. All right, yep. So overall, right. of the movies you've been in, what was your worst? And what was your favorite costume or outfit? Ooh. The worst? I don't... I guess the worst thing that ever happened to me, I did that show called Angel. And the mask I had to wear was not made for my face. It kind of burned my neck, kind of coming off. It irritated me so that it looked like I been hanged. That, that was probably my worst on set. You know, that's a... You know, you get hurt or banged up doing these action movies sometimes. You, like, pirates, the sword would give me a bruise on my fat belly or my big giant belt buckle. You know, running and then you get nailed. Oh, God, my leg had to bruise. bruised. So you're going to get banged up. But I love that costume. I love being in it. I love playing that character. So, Vernon, and then what was the other, what was my favorite? What was your favorite? Uh, Do you know what would be my favorite? Probably Leroy. Leroy? Yeah, I love that uh, that lumberjack look, the gray coats. The I love all that stuff, the vest, the hat. Now, in the, the first boots. season, you were a security guard for Mayor Mills in the um, hospital? No, I wasn't. Uh, oh, yeah. With um, Faustino de Boda, he fell asleep. Yeah, 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 yeah. Walter was one. I was a security guard in that scene. I, I guess I was, yeah. I was. You, you got mad at her. I think I was with Emma Swan. It was Emma and Mary Margaret, maybe? Yep, they, I, haven't, I haven't watched season one in a while. I love season one. It was when uh, um, Josh Dallas's character, Charming, um, David Nolan, ended up yeah, getting David Nolan, the hospital the tool. on his own. What? what? He does what? He escaped from the hospital, and the oh, yeah. video footage didn't show uh, what was going on. Yeah. I remember the scene. There's a couple pictures that I have from that. Uh, looking worried. I mean, the character changed. I think that was pretty early on, that scene. I forget what what episode number was that. Um, that I can't... I have the DVDs over here, but I can't remember the episode. Yeah, okay. um, but it was... Right it was season one, for sure. Season one. That's when I did Mickey Matson, right? It was season one. I had a break in season one where they were not telling I wasn't in it, and uh, that's when I did Mickey Matson. Season one of one. All right. Well, um, outside of that, um, we have some questions from some people I know. Um, cool. I'm going to check my TikTok here to see if anybody's... One person tried to do a join, tried to join the live, but I wasn't doing that because I didn't want people interfering with the audio. Um, so the first mm. question I'm going to ask, I have a friend of mine from Des Moines, Iowa, um, Buddy J, cool. uh, he had a question asking, what were the auditions like for Pirates of the Caribbean slash OUAT, and are there any major differences between those two? Well, I mean, basically both of them I had to go to the casting director. I started at the casting director uh, and read for the casting director on tape. That was that was that was a similarity. I think for pirates, then I, w I went to the uh, had a lead for the director too, and, and 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 that was that. But I was real lucky on pirates. They uh, didn't cast that part out of England when they came to Hollywood. Whereas once upon a time, I think they pretty much started in L.A. and they might have even had me on their radars on the list at least uh, for Grumpy. 
I mean, honestly, I, I've never fit a part better than a fit grumpy in terms of just like, like I felt, I felt very comfortable in that role with all the dynamics of friendship to snow and charming and just where he fit in that world of, uh, you know, Leroy's function, the comedic function, the town crier, you know, it was, I, I loved, I mean, there's something really, I love being a pirate too. The pirate was probably the, you know, the manifestation of the childhood dream to be a pirate. But the grumpy role and the Leroy and all the stuff I got to do was more of a mature, like how I felt, how I feel now. Like much, I'm dreamy and grumpy, you know, kind of, it's easy to make that for me. Um, yeah. Now, in your opinion, are there any differences between a movie audition and a TV show audition? Like, any major differences at all, in your opinion? No. They're no. The same? Yeah. I mean, they all want to see to be truthful and not full of tricks, and you just got to go there and be the character. Uh, I mean, you may... Sometimes you can... Sometimes you might be going in to meet where, where they, you know... Sometimes they roll you through... They're seeing 10 people for a part. You know, there's no time to schmooze, to chat. Sometimes you might have a few minutes to get to know these other artists, you know. I actually prefer when I can talk to them. It's like, you know, you're ta- we're the talent. You, you sort of want people to respect that and not like you're just another actor on the thing. I mean, that's one of the battles of the game, to, like, have them just have a chat with you and want you. It's just like life, you know. We want to be wanted. Um, also, uh, another one, uh, Stacy L. from Texas asked three questions. Um, she said, what is your favorite episode and or season slash seasons of OUAT? I mean, I like my own, I like the origin stuff for Grumpy, so I like Dreamy episode. I like when I, the, the episode a couple before that where I meet Snow White. Definitely, I'm a season one, season two uh, were my favorites of the show. I think season one was the best. And the, like, as I love the fact that we are these magical characters with no knowledge who we are. So, like, we were the most fucked up, pardon my language, characters in the first season. You know, it was fun that the the selling candles with Mary Margaret and the whole why the guy's grumpy is obviously going to ring resonate with me being cracked out of an egg with a giant beard. I mean, it was fun, like Pixar, you know, storytelling. So I'm very proud of that. I'm just very proud that they asked me to contribute to that show. Love that show. Um, but that being said, I mean, there's so many great things that happened on it throughout the years um, in, in all the seasons. So, but, my, but I'm definitely a season one, season two dude. And that in mind, what was your best memory on set of Once Upon a Time? I mean, too many to name one, but it was definitely the laughter. I like—I mean, some of my favorite memories was being Josh's acting coach and trying to crack Jimmy up uh, in between the takes, the long nights in the forest or whatever it was. Um, I had a lot of love for all those people, though. There was a lot of love on that show. I love, you know, J Mo and Lana. You know, anyone you got to toe the line with, Colin, um, my dwarf buddies. You know, I miss my buddy Gabe and all that. And so, yeah, the, lots of love on that show. That was the key that we found. That all of us just connecting and telling these great stories and playing these magical characters. Right? We would have fun off screen. The boys would play golf or we'd go to dinner with everyone or grab a lunch or go to lunch with, like, you know, Megan and and, uh, and Ginny or something, you know. And it was like, here, I'm just snow and red. And, you know, I love, I love Beverly. And, and then we all went on to do all these conventions. So there I became, like, really close, close with Chris Gauthier and with, you know, better friends with Bex and Karen David because we're going out and doing shows. Well, we didn't have tons of scenes together, but we would have, these life experiences of, of going and entertaining the fans and find, and meeting the great fans of the Oncers are amazing. I had heard, Bob, I had heard Bobby was a, uh, 
iconic uh, person to socialize with and uh, when you were off set. Robert, uh, Bobby Carlisle? Carlisle. Yeah. You know, what, a, what an amazing guy. Right? So, yeah. I would say the same thing about Lana. I would say the same thing about Josh. I mean, Colin. You know? So, I mean, we were lucky. Sean McGuire. Great people to hang with. Great people. You know, we were all away from home. We were all traveled from all over the world to tell those stories. Right. And her last question, did you keep any props, or did you get to keep any props from Once Upon a Time? Uh, from once? No, I mean, if I could have kept anything, I would have tried to keep my hat. Uh, but they lost the hat. And so I had, like, the last season or something, I'm wearing a close match, but it wasn't. For the longest time, that Leroy hat had some of the fairy dust in it oh. from when they sprinkled me with this glitter. It stayed in that hat for six years or seven years. And it could clean it and still be in it. It was cool. I love that hat. Um, no, I don't think I got, I mean, I got my chair back, which is always the cool one from your cast chair. Mm -hmm. um, Would you have gotten a pickaxe that said uh, happy or, or dreamy or grumpy on it? Yeah, I would have, actually. I'm surprised I don't have one of those. I forget why I don't. Although, I'm not as much into having a bunch of stuff. Gotcha. Some people like to have stuff. I don't really have a place to put my stuff, always. So, the memories are just as good for me. My wife and I had a, um, and this is kind of a tribute to um, Once Upon a Time. We had a Once Upon a Time themed wedding, and I actually got this. Ooh. Amazon, oh, that's cool. And it's a full-length, heavyweight sword. Wow. <laughs> um, that was, I actually went and, I'm, as you noticed, I'm transgender male to female, but I played a male yep. role in the wedding, which was charming. Okay. Oh, nice. And I actually created my, I'll send you a picture sometime, I created my whole entire outfit from scratch to Ooh. look like charming with the fur around his neck and <laughs> the... Um, Purple, blue. Uh, yeah, yeah. Tape. I know that outfit. I remember that I outfit. I did it all. The lacing on the front, the sequins. Very yeah. cool. But, um, yeah, so I, big Once Upon a Time fan. <laughs> I can't. Well, remember. you know what? I appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, we love our fans and we support, uh, you know, all your creativity and, you know, but you're nothing without your fans in this business. We actually need we need you, or we need the fans more than they need us. So, very grateful to the to the oncers, crazy as you oncers are. Oh, yeah. All right, um, I'm gonna go ahead and that person that just did a request, I'm gonna let them go ahead and pop on. I'm gonna let one person at least go ahead and send that request again. If they're still there, Hang on. nope, they're not. All right, um, maybe I should have just let them. <laughs> Um, all right. So, Good job. Good job. All right. So the other thing I want to make a note of here is you and I have talked before um, about interactions with um, fans. Now, I've been blessed to befriend you as well as Michael Coleman, Faustino DeBoda. Um, you're all very kind people, and I've spoken with you about this. But for the record, what is your take on celebrities interacting with their fans and the impact that doing or not doing so has on their fans? Oh, interesting. Good question. Um, I think, you know, with proper, like with respect, a two-way amount of respect, it's cool. Um, I mean, I remember when you, you, you made a valid point. Does anyone respond? I was like, oh, my gosh, I'm, I'm into responding. I'm like, hello, I'm cool. We're all just people. We, you know, the actors, and I think sometimes the fans take it too far. Mm -hmm. um, and so in a lot of ways, then it can abuse the relationship and burn it for the next fan that comes along and just is wanting to connect, right? So, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty chill about that, uh, but I can understand why their people have boundaries in place on it. Um, when it comes from mutual respect, when it comes from uh, that position, I, I I think it's awesome. 
And there's plenty of chances, like there's conventions, there's places to meet, there are ways to meet celebrities um, that are that are uh, good for the fans and good for the actors. And, the, and there's and that's what those conventions are. There's a whole business about it. But you, you know, you actually um, were very cool. You were you were persistent, you know, and you you and you got your way. And I was like, that's what got me. I was like, I didn't want to, you know, I don't like people getting their feelings hurt or feeling like they're not heard. And so there you go. I took a chance and, and I guessed right about you, that you were cool, that I wanted to support your dreams. I want to see you successful. And uh, that would give me, you know, happiness, that you're happy in your identity, in your whole life journey of however you want to be in this world and how you see yourself. And that, you know, most importantly, that you believe that you can do whatever the fuck you want. In this and, and right, you know, and that's another reason why you're one of my favorite characters on OUAT is because, and as a person, is because you and your character Leroy aren't that much different. And <laughs> when you said "stay dreamy," yeah, you meant it. It's, it's I thought you did it. Yeah, I mean for sure. Listen, I am no, I am nothing. We're nobody's anything. Like just because you have a cool job, you're not better than anyone. Like, no one's better than anyone. I don't care if you're president or whatever, to the janitor. Like, well, no. everyone's got a role. There's choices we make along the way. I choose to be awesome. I want to be an awesome person. I choose to be, to, to, to like my fans, to learn, to be curious. So, it, it, and then, like I said, that dreamy, grumpy role, I mean, there wasn't a lot of acting. You put a lot of was, in yeah, because that's kind of like I mean I'm a you know I'm a cra crabby guy. I'm, a cancer. <laughs> I'm emotional too. Like you know I cry easy. I can't watch dog movies. You know, like I'm sentimental. So I, I could really relate to the sentimental parts of it and the heartfelt stuff. That because that's what storytelling is all about. Trying to like connect. And for me, when you connect through the heart. Sometimes you connect through the gut with a laugh. Sometimes in the brain with a thought. But when you hit the heart, man, that's a bullseye. And any, it's always described as a bullseye. Cupid's arrow. But like when you can touch a heart, it's like connects. It breaks down barriers. It's why why we're really storytellers. It's what we get out of it. And that's you know, the thing that Michael Coleman actually projected to me was that when I applied to go to school at um, Story. Uh, Institute. Okay. That's the question they asked me is, what is your take on acting? And I said, well, it's a person telling a story. You're a storyteller. Yeah. You um, just can't, can't, can't get caught doing it. Yeah. In fact, uh, Michael sent me this, which you're in this photo actually with snow. I don't know if you remember this scene. Oh, that's, yeah, for sure I do. That's the, uh, that's a, a real great scene when we were in the forest, and, and he goes, uh, that's when he, tell, he stops him from taking the poison. Michael sent me this um, photo, signed it, said, hi-ho, hi-ho, um, and then signed Michael Coleman, happy. Thanks for watching, yeah. Jessica, and uh, sent me that in the mail. So I have that hanging up on my wall right by the door. That's <laughs> a cool one. My, my tripod's falling over here. Hang on a second. There we go. Let the TikTok viewers see you. So, um, yeah, um, I guess in closing, because we're reaching the one hour mark here, just got some closing questions. So, to the people that are on TikTok here, and just in general, um, this is going up on YouTube as well, um, what advice would you tell our younger generation as, let's say, some pearls of wisdom? <laughs> You there?
think we lost him. I think we lost him here, let's see. rejoining again. Like we've lost the Ehrenberg here, but um, We lost you for a while. I think I got kicked off the, my Wi-Fi crash. Oh. So we'll just wrap it just in case it happens again. It's windy here, okay. so I don't know if that had anything to do with it. But uh, we get these uh, these giant winds that come. That's why we get the bad fires. So I don't know. Sometimes they shut the power down. Sometimes they do weird shit when the winds come up. All right. Well, I got two final questions. Um, okay, great. First one, uh, which we didn't get to, was what would you tell our younger generation – and, you know, some pearls of wisdom about uh, just anything, really. Well, no, interesting. Um, don't really have, I don't know if they're pearls of wisdom, but be grateful for everything you have. I think the way to manifest your dreams is to stay positive. If something doesn't serve you, then get rid of it. Don't use it. Park it. Um Always try and bring your awesome. Because it really affects everyone. When you're just trying trying to be an awesome person and not taking things personal and just trying trying your best, good things happen. And your dreams come true that way. You gotta you get you have some responsibility, but you're making a choice with uh you know, like to to be nice to everyone and be of service and just be kind to the people you love, you know. And then lastly, which kind of goes along the same uh, spectrum here, what advice do you have for people wanting to get into acting that are okay. in the field? Don't do it. 
seriously, don't do it is my first piece of advice. But if you if that doesn't work, then welcome to the club. Okay. Yeah. I mean, because it's challenging life. You're going to have to, like, you know, uh, you'll be tested in this business no matter how much success you have. You get tested emotionally. You'll get tested about your ego. You'll get tested about a lot of lessons, you know. It's not easy to do it. Don't do it for the stardom. Don't do it for the attention. Do it because you have to do it. You have to be a storyteller. You get off on the connecting of the souls. You get off on telling the stories. When you do it for that, good things happen, right? And also get on your, get on, everyone can be like you're doing now, Jess. It's like you're creating content. You're going for it, right? You're interviewing me and it's like you have Mikey and you do, you know, you'll probably get Fausti to be on and stuff like that. So good on you. You're doing the thing with your friend. It's like, that's what I would say. Be, be, go for it. Create your own content. Get some acting class. Always be in class. Find a good teacher. Um, do a play, stay busy, but don't do it as number one. <laughs> Let me start with that. It's funny, it's a good joke, but it's also the truth. Anyone can be, why not, why not you, I say to the young actor. Why not you? you there's no reason why you can't be whatever you want, mm -hmm. but, but it's, a, it's a challenging business. And... Um, yeah, if you can't be talked out of doing it, then welcome to the club. Okay. All right. Well, thank you again. I do appreciate it, as always. Um, yeah. And wonderful to have you as a friend, as well yeah. as an actor. Likewise. We love you yeah. guys. You, are, you, all of you on Once Upon a Time are wonderful. Um, well, thank you. And thanks for having me. Thanks for doing this. It's always cool to, uh, you know, pay it forward and to encourage other people in our business to go through their dreams, too. So I'd like to use this opportunity to thank you for the, you know, inviting me on your show, Jess. And, and you know, I, I want you to crush it. Crush, go out there and crush it. Thank you. Um, stay, stay tuned or stay on here after this. I'm going to pause the screen record for the um, interview. I just got some questions off the interview for you. All right. All right. <laughs>